Pastor Rock, it's great to be with you. And for those of you that may be watching who don't know, this is Pastor Rock Dilliman, now your pastor emeritus. Yes. You are lead pastor here at Allegheny Center Alliance Church for 36 years. Prior, 36. Prior to uh, me coming in January of 2020. And uh, just want to say thank you. Uh, what a powerful message um, a week ago it was and following in the importance of following the spirit and um, being a spirit led spirit empowered people of course that's um, I mean you pastored here for 36 years so I feel like I'm preaching to the choir in that's some right. ways but one choir of choir sometimes needs preaching <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> uh, our first marker in our DNA is we are spirit led people mm -hmm. so extremely important uh, one of the questions I often get asked, and I'm sure you did as your times of pastoring as well, is, okay, we, we talk about we are spirit-led people. We know mm -hmm. it's important. You preached on that. It's when you get to the nuts and bolts of how. Right. How do I follow the Spirit's leading? How do I hear God's voice? Is this an audible? Am I just waiting? Is he going to speak out loud, talk through my car radio? I mean, <laughs> how, how, how is it, it going to happen? So... Um, yeah, if someone were to ask you, part of the congregation, how do you hear God's voice? What would be your first response? Well, there are 72 points to that. <laughs> and see, when you start that way... Get your then, coffee. It's going to be a long video. Then the conversation ends. Yeah. They just glaze over and it's done. Well, Hebrews 5.14, I think, is a, a critical verse in that regard. Okay. It talks about the mature as having trained their senses. And discerning the voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit is the culmination of training your spiritual senses. And my father taught me that by example, and then I had to learn it for myself. Yeah. But I think there's a, a, a process you go through. You don't just pray, I want to be spirit-led, and suddenly you're very discerning and adept at intuiting the Holy Spirit. There's a growing, a, a training mm -hmm. of your senses. And that begins, first of all, I believe, with your core commitments. If you're going to be able to hear the voice of the Spirit, you have to be walking in the ways of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, and these are topics that could be separate sure. round tables, if you will, but you have to be dying to the flesh, denying the flesh, because that gets in the way, that's a substitute for following the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And you need to uh, be able to recognize how the Spirit works. And you won't begin to make those recognitions until you die to the flesh and surrender your life to the Lord. Uh, George Mueller, who was notorious for spiritual discernment, said that the best way to know the will of God and discern the will of God is to first of all have no will of your own. Hmm. So he was talking about being in a position of having surrendered the leadership of your life to the Lord. Once you do that, as briefly as possible, because it, it's pretty detailed, but as briefly as possible, I think you have to live with a conscious seeking. Yeah. You're not going to hear what you're not seeking. Right. If you aren't expecting, you're not going to be receiving. Right. So you have to live with this conscious seeking after the voice and the leading of the Spirit. Now, you know full well, many days you won't have a, ooh, that was clearly the Lord right. speaking. You'll continue running on the things that the Lord has shown you previously, yeah. as well as Scripture. And, and I, I should say that a prerequisite, in addition to denying the flesh and surrendering your will, a prerequisite is to know your Bible. Yeah. Because that's that first comes, and foremost. That's first God and speaks. foremost. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Because the Spirit will lead you in the application of truth. He'll leave you inside, lead you inside the boundaries of His truth, but He's never got to contradict it. Right. And so if you don't have a good working knowledge of Scripture as the baseline, mm 
Mm-hmm. It's going to hinder your ability, I believe, to yeah. discern the leading of the spirit. So you begin with a conscious awareness of the need, and it's not every waking moment, but you're living with that awareness. I'm, I'm listening. I'm looking. I need. And then when you're in that place, I have found the Lord does three things. First of all, plants the seed of an idea. Okay. Now, we all have a hundred different ideas go through our minds on a daily basis. Yeah. And they're not all God. But that is how God begins to lead. He plants the seed right. of an idea. I heard you reference the fact that years ago mm. you wrote in your journal. Yeah that you wanted to one day pastor an urban multicultural church. Right. Where'd that idea come from? Yeah. I mean, that's not the kind of idea no. you just wake up one day and, hey, that's something I'd like to do. Right. It may have been the Mexican food because I was living in Houston at the time. Yeah, well, but... that's, that's a different <laughs> kind that. of leading. <laughs> but I, I, to your point, I know it. Uh, yeah, exactly. He plants exactly. the seed of exactly an idea. Right. All right. Yeah. So that's the starting point. But then if it's the Lord, he strengthens and supports that idea. Yeah. Now, that can happen through something you're reading in Scripture. And there's that, ooh, connection sense, mm-hmm. like, oh, that aligns with that idea. Yeah. You feel like something's being affirmed. It can be people saying something to yeah. you. People and are a great way of affirming. I'm sure you've had yeah. the experience. Somebody says something mm-hmm. to you that just sounds an alarm in your soul because it's perfectly aligning with this idea from the Lord, Mm -hmm. but they don't know you have that idea. They're not aware you're thinking about it, but they say something as the Spirit leads them that just, bam. It confirms what God has already spoken in your heart. It confirms. So it can be from people. It can be from Scripture. Doesn't even have to be fellow believers. Hmm. God can speak something through an unbeliever to you. So... He supports it, and he strengthens it. And one of the ways I always found that he strengthens it is through what I like to call sanctified daydreaming. Sanctified daydreaming. Sanctified daydreaming, meaning the Lord will stir your imagination to picture yourself doing that thing, that idea. Vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before I came to ACAC... I found myself thinking, what would I do in this kind of a context? And picturing myself in this and what I would say and how I would function and so on. Well, that's how the Holy Spirit supports and strengthens this concept. So there are a lot of different ways, including sanctified daydreaming, because there is unsanctified daydreaming (laughs) as well, when you're just in the office glassing over. And then... The third thing is he sustains it. Hmm. Things that aren't of the Lord have a short shelf life. They go away. So time is an element of that. Time is a big element. Things that are of the Spirit and of God last He sustains it. It just doesn't go away. So the idea, the strengthening of it, the supporting of it, he sustains it. And after he sustains it, you come to that place where it's a conviction, meaning... I know this is what God is leading me. Right. I know this is what God is saying to me. Yeah. A, a conviction is just that sustained impression yeah. from the Holy Spirit. So I have always found those three steps, the seeding of the idea, strengthening and supporting it, and sustaining it over time. And then the final piece, you have to then, once you know it, you have to step out in faith and obey it. Right. Because if you don't put it into action, well, then you'll never get the confirmation. Right. But you've also signaled God that you're really not willing to follow his leading mm-hmm. unless you put it into action. And as you do those things in smaller matters and larger matters over time, you train your senses. Right. And what originally was difficult or took a while starts to be a little more natural starts to come to you a little more quickly. Right. And, and then a final thing, and I'll shut up. Uh, you've heard me mention, you've probably had similar experiences. Mm-hmm. There have been times when somebody's ap- approached me, and as they're walking toward me, the Spirit says, I want you to say 
such and such to that person. And it's been about a healing. It's Mm -hmm. been about having a child. It's been about a job, things of that nature. Words of knowledge, all of them have been fulfilled. People say, well, what's that like? It's that process I just described compressed into maybe 10 or 15 seconds. Hmm. And I've had that kind of experience, literally somebody about to pass me at the door after service full of cancer. And God said, tell Olive, I'm going to heal her cancer. Wow. Now, I didn't have days or weeks to go apart and pray and wait. I had maybe 15, 20 seconds till she got to me. Hmm. But it was that same idea, strengthened, sustained, only it was all compressed because it had to be. But that comes, I want to go back to something you said, because oftentimes when people think of hearing the voice of the Lord, they can go to that. You know, I I have a word for you. and, and, And I really appreciate what you emphasize. And I like saying this way is that pursuing God is essential to hearing God. Absolutely. Like, like you have to be, it's, it's John 15 or 16, you have to be connected to the vine. Um, the, you have to be connected to Jesus in, in prayer, in scripture, um, in listening. Oftentimes in prayer, you know, we spend a lot of time speaking, God, this is what I need, this is what I want, mm-hmm. and we don't shut up and stop and listen. And so um, I, just going back to, I appreciate what you said. So for one, for me, I think, it, I think it goes with pursuing. Like we have to be pursuing God's presence, reading his scripture, praying and all of that. But you mentioned your dad, and I, I know from getting to know you that how influential your dad mm-hmm. was in your life and mine as well. And I, I was thinking about it when we talk about hearing God's voice, hearing the Father's voice. Um, I know your dad isn't with us anymore, but right. you can probably remember the sound of his voice. Oh, yes. And I know the sound of my dad's voice. And it is that training. It's it's that, um, I've shared it before, you know, my, when my son was younger, you lose him in a store and you call out, well, my son knows my voice. Yeah. And it is that training that as you spend time in prayer and you spend time in his word, you begin to recognize as you grow in faith and spiritual maturity, you recognize the voice of the Father. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's not like a one time you become a Christ follower and boom, I recognize it. It's a it's a training. It's, it's, it's a training, training your that senses. you have. Yeah. Another thing you mentioned that I, I just is so important on um, God sustaining that. Like you mentioned, uh, I do remember, I was in Houston, Texas. Uh, I, I was a worship pastor at the time and writing in a journal that I that I just really sensed God was going to call me one day to pastor an urban multicultural church. That was well, the that seed. Was, that was 25 years ago. And oftentimes when we have those seeds, we want them the next day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And if you look, you know, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but Moses... Um, the promises of God all throughout the old Joseph had a dream, but it was years mm-hmm. away from that happening. Uh, we were talking before we hit play on this. One of the moments in my life and my wife and I's life where we clearly hear, heard the voice of the Lord and really felt the spirit leading us was here at ACAC. So, um, you know, I was contacted by slingshot. I think it was like April, February. You of, might tell people that's a search firm. That is a, shot. yeah, sorry for those who don't know. Otherwise, um, it sounds like you were a target of David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you were pastoring here. The church was going through succession. So you were looking for the next mm-hmm. lead pastor. And um, the search firm, name Slingshot, reaches out to me. I've known of ACAC. You and I had never met. And, um, you know, we were 24 miles away. So I was like, <laughs> hey, honey, let's, we, we have the opportunity. Let's go worship at ACAC. Let's see. So unbeknownst to anybody here, um, I remember exactly where we were sitting. Pre sir, I remember what the songs were. We're sitting there. <laughs> My wife's tearing up before the service is even starting. I'm like, what's going on? And in that service, I clearly, I was like, I, I told my, we're coming here. Like, we're going to be the next. Now, I had not gone through one interview. <laughs> you and I had not met. And that wasn't presumption. I just, and I had to guard who I said that to. Oh, yes. And because it can sound arrogant, if yeah. You and I, I mean, even saying that now, I, it wasn't a you know, 
didn't mean I didn't get nervous in the interview and do a prepare, but there was a season that we had to go through. And uh, I just think that's so critical for you people. You know, many know. years earlier, decades <laughs> earlier, yeah. I was pastoring up near Erie mm -hmm. and I heard that ACAC was open. And the day I heard ACAC was open, the Spirit you said, that same, wow. you're going there. Yeah. And when we came down to meet with the congregation and the board and so on, all the while, I knew we were coming here. Yeah. And again, that's the kind of thing you don't share because it's like, well, this guy's full of himself. Right. You know, he's assuming we're going to call him. But the Lord had told me that the day I heard this church was open, yeah. the Spirit said, you're going there. I want to take us one direction with that. Because um, when we talk about that hearing God's voice. Uh, I, my undergrad, you know this, I went to Oral Roberts University. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really do appreciate about the ministry of Oral Roberts and going to that school was an emphasis on hearing the voice of God. And yeah. Oral would always say there's a still small voice. And uh, if I could read this, it, it, that really comes from 1 Kings, where um, the Lord says to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replies, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And then uh, God responds, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord tells him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. Mm -hmm. And then there was an earthquake. The Bible says the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the fire, uh, there was a sound of a gentle whisper, and the Lord was in a gentle whisper. And oftentimes, I, I think as we talk about hearing the voice of God and what we can do to train our ear, I think we also have to talk about the things that take away. That the God, it wasn't in the loud earthquake. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in the mighty wind. It's a subtle, still, small voice. What do you think are some of the things that take away or distract us, uh, distract people from hearing God's voice? Well, blockers, if you will. Yeah. First of all, failure to make the core commitments necessary to discern. Hmm. Earlier, I said we have to surrender our will. And Mueller's comment about have no will of your own, yeah. that positions you to know the will of God. Well, if you're just looking for God to affirm and enable what you want to do, mm -hmm. that's what the Bible calls flesh. Yeah. And if you're moving in the flesh, you aren't moving in the spirit. And if you aren't moving in the spirit, you won't be able to discern the spirit. So that deep commitment to dying to self, surrendering your will, and truly living under new management not just asking God to be a value-added commodity to your life, but to really be the Lord of everything. Right. If you don't make that commitment and sustain it on a day-to-day -day basis because it's always being challenged, you just aren't positioned right. to hear. And so that, that's the most fundamental. Then the lack of effort to train your senses, you know, just expecting... I mean, you've seen how many times will people sign up to go to a meeting to sit under the preaching and teaching of some religious celebrity, hoping that it's going to transform their life. Yeah. And, and they're looking for somebody from the outside to touch them, pray over them, give a word, and it's going to change everything. Yeah. But they're not doing what they need to do. And so if you just want to coast and look for God to give you a sun zap or read somebody's book and get that, that'll hinder you. Just immature approaches, I would call it. And then the obvious one is uh, continuing in conscious sin. And I want to be careful. You don't have to be sinless and perfect to hear from God or yeah. nobody would hear from God. Right. But if you are consciously entertaining a, a repetitive sin, a rebellion you're against living God, in sin. you're living in yeah. it, uh, it's become part of who you are in essence, yeah. that certainly is going to dull your spiritual senses. And then that old bugaboo pride. Yeah. 
Uh, if you want to hear from God so that you can let others know that you hear from God, mm. and you know as well as I do, that goes on. Sometimes the ones claiming to be hearing from God, <laughs> you, you listen about five seconds and you know, no, this is just ego. Yeah. That, that will make you essentially deaf to the leading of God's Spirit because God didn't send the Holy Spirit to be used for your ego. Yeah. Unbelief, mm -hmm. uh, idolatry, uh, all of those things dull our spiritual senses and work against a sense of that is trained and discerning. Yeah. I, one of the things I just, I thought about this when you were saying it, um, I think it's so important too that we need to be careful when we may sense that we have a word for the Lord, for somebody, mm -hmm. uh, whether that be, you know, as you, you mentioned, Olive in the yes. middle of a service or your child. I've had moments where I felt, and I've learned this through time, is that what I try to always do is um, I frame it in a way, um, Rock, this is what I sense hmm. the Lord is saying to me for you, um, not a Rock, thus saith the right. Lord God. I, like, I think it's really important because we are human. And, and to let that, you need to affirm this in Scripture. You need to affirm this through prayer. I pray that you would have divine people come into your life that would mm -hmm. affirm this. Like, take that pressure off of it being, thus saith the Lord by, you know, you're going to receive $1,000 in the next, yes. and we won't get into that. That's a right. different video. But... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But I just think yeah. it's so important that when God does give us those things that we recognize through humility, and that's what you were talking about there, a spirit of humility that, um, I believe the Lord said this, but I want to present it to you in a way that you can see this affirmed mm -hmm. through Scripture and other When people, people are asking me about sharing a word of knowledge or a prophetic word with another person, similar thing. I, mm -hmm. I always counsel them to say, I believe God has shown me this in relationship yeah, to you. It's a great way of saying it. Mm -hmm. But if it is indeed of the Lord, he will confirm that to you. Mm -hmm. I, I never made it based upon me. I, I never wanted somebody to go out and do something or anticipate something or believe something because That's really good. I said it. Yeah. So I'd say, I have an obvious conviction, God has this for you, or I wouldn't share it. But I'm human. Yeah. And so I could miss, receive it. And if it's from the Lord, He will confirm that to you. And that's what I said to Olive. I said, Olive, I believe God wants me to tell you that He's going to heal your cancer. But you can't just take that from me. If it's God, and I believe it is, but if it's God, all of he's got to confirm that to you. Yeah. And I've done that with any leading that involves speaking into another person's life. You know as well as I do, there are people that just want to use God to yeah. inflate their own sense of importance. Yeah. Or they want to be big fish in a small pond of a local congregation mm -hmm. and walk around, God told you, I mean the abuses, you're to marry this person. Or people who are awkward in dating saying, God has shown me you're gotta be my wife. That's, that's a real non-starter for most young ladies. Uh, those are such corrupted and immature ideas, but they also lack yeah. humility. Yep, that's it. So I have to ask, did Olive receive her healing? Two weeks later, she was coming by and she leaned over and she said, Pastor, they redid all of my scans and they could not find a trace of cancer wow. in my body. Wow. Praise God. God still heals today. Her name was Olive Jones. She's been with the Lord for quite wow. some time. But yeah. Well, hey, I, uh, this is impromptu and we're trying to keep these videos uh, short and we are going to wrap up, but uh, I want us to, I'm going to steer us a direction that could be dangerous, but I, <laughs> but you you mentioned professionalism versus spirit empowerment. Mm -hmm. So specifically, so if you're not a pastor, if you're not a part of church leadership, you can shut the video down and you're off. But <laughs> they may have you, shut you, off. Already. They may already have. 
but you probably know where I'm going. Can we talk just a minute? Mm-hmm. Organizationally, and the church is an organization, it so is. don't accuse me of, you know. And there's good and bad organizational yes. management. Yes. yes. Um, but pastoring um, in leading a church, a spirit, spirit-led. spirit um, We were having some conversation today. I'll kick it off this way. Uh, looking at the budgeting process mm-hmm. and certainly a challenges challenges that um, we have in an urban context. And I made the comment to a couple of our staff today. I said, you know, um, I've come to the realization and 36 years here again, this you realize this probably a long time ago. We're never going to enter into a budget conversation where we feel comfortable. Like, oh, no. <laughs> like, yeah. like if we ever, and maybe it just hit me today because we were having that conversation, but if we ever get to the point where like, we feel good, like, okay, this is a good budget. Um, we feel comfortable. We have this much in savings, this much in reserve. Yeah, we can do that. We don't need the spirit. Like, I mean, that's what, and that's what you were saying. Like we've well, now I, eliminated. I when I was pastoring, I wouldn't have been opposed to that. <laughs> But in 45 years, I never experienced that. Yeah, uh, you know what I'm saying, and, well, I'm, yeah. I, and I'm not talking about we need to we need to be disciplined. We need to have savings. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there is always an element of being a spirit led church. Right. You are always going to be uncomfortable. Well, following the spirit usually puts you out on the ragged edge. Uh, the great spirit way doesn't it. lead us into places of great comfort. Yeah. He puts us out on the growing edge of faith. Yeah, uh, We've always, here at ACAC, had wonderful church treasurers. Yeah. And, and our treasurer now, Enzo, mm-hmm. and this is the commercial he paid me for, uh, <laughs> no, is, is just an exemplary church treasurer. Yeah. Because he will be very forthright about the giving of God's people, the expenses, financial trends, reality. Mm -hmm. But if the vote is faith or non-faith, Enzo is going to be on the side of faith. And so years ago, I said to him, I said, it occurs to me that a good church treasure, a spirit-led church treasure, won't try to discourage faith they'll let you know how much faith you're going to need. <laughs> that's really good. And, that's and, good. and that's what Enzo did. Yeah. And, and the treasure before him and the treasure before him, we've had an incredible group that's of really good. godly people. So there's financial realities. You look at them. People that just plunge ahead and say, oh, we're just trusting God. They usually end up in a yeah. bad place. You need to do your homework. Look at the trends and so on. But but if there is a sense that the Spirit is saying, do this. Mm-hmm. Spirit-led says, we know it doesn't make sense in light of the projections. We know it's got to be far beyond last year. Looking at it naturally, it, it's not feasible. Mm-hmm. But we believe God is ordering this. And I've been in that kind of a place numerous times over my 45 years. And every time we followed in faith what we believe God was saying, mm-hmm. the provision was there every yeah. single time. Uh, but, you, but you have to be willing to step out. Right. And, and that's why I used to open our board meetings here, whether, whether it was the elders or the ops board, by praying, Lord, remember, we're not here so much to decide as we are to, to discern. discern. That's right. God already has plans for this stuff. You know, he may leave the color of the chairs up to us, but the big stuff, he's got a plan. And a governance board, an elder board's task is to discern that plan, not mm. to pool their collective wisdom and come up with something. Yeah. I want to ask you one last question as we wrap, but to make a comment on that too, because um, the flip side of that, and as a worship pastor for so many years, I would hear this, that you know, being spirit-led, say in worship, means that it, for some, it's almost like, well, we can't plan. 
we need to we need to not and i saw you sit yeah. up in your chair because i i feel that way too and for me like specifically in worship i completely disagree with that and disagree yeah. with that in fact i believe that the more planned and the more prepared you are the more you are clearly able to hear god's voice mm-hmm. if i if i know what songs we're doing and the and the band and the singers are prepared or even on a sermon and a ser- like we do as much preparation as possible it removes if i'm not having to think about okay what's happening next what's my next point and where am i going here what am i saying then i am free to do that and then when i sense in those moments that the spirit is leading this way mm-hmm. I'm not distracted by the pressure of everything else. Now, we I would like carve time, like say, hey, in this in this right here, we're gonna sit on these three chords or we're gonna uh, follow this progression here and see what God does there. Mm-hmm. So I yeah, I, I just I don't want to say, you know, we don't plan, we don't save, we don't prepare. Exact opposite. Preparation leads to you being actually able to flow in the spirit better, I think. Absolutely. I used to put it this way. Spontaneity follows preparation. Yeah. It's amazing how you take what I say and you narrow it down to like five words. You have a gift with that. so That's a spirit gift. (laughs) (laughs) But some people mistakenly think to be of the spirit, it has to be all unplanned and spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Much of what the spirit does involves planning. There are those moments when the spirit for lack of a better word interrupts Mm -hmm. and says take it this direction or i know we didn't plan it go here but that kind of spontaneity follows preparation it's not a substitute absolutely for preparation it's like the guy the young preacher who said i'll either be original or nothing and he quickly proved to be both you know he didn't prepare uh when you prepare your teaching and you labor over the text and you seek the Lord through the yeah. week and, and, and you work on your language and what words will best convey this and so on, that's not contrary to the Spirit. That's laying the groundwork to be able then to really hear the Spirit mm-hmm. if He interjects something, which I'm sure you've experienced, I experienced often. In your message, in your teaching, the Lord will give you something. You know it's fresh in that moment. But that comes when we've done our part. Mm. So some people think, well, if it isn't a spontaneous, it's not of God. That's very immature. Their, their senses aren't trained. And the other thing, quickly, some people think it has to be off-the-wall bizarre to be of the Spirit. If it's... If it feels like good sense or wisdom, well, that's man. Yeah. It, it's got to be, you know, go sell your Chevy and buy a house in uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, and then I'll give you other directions. That's, that's bizarre, man. That's Fruit yeah. Loop City. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. He doesn't work in ridiculous ways. He doesn't work in bizarre ways. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be spontaneous, and it shouldn't be bizarre. But again, if you're living this listening lifestyle, training your senses, you get to where you can, you can tell the difference. Yeah. I mean, I've had people say to me, the Spirit showed me, and I just say, well, if it's the Spirit, He'll show me, but I know yeah. it's not from the Lord. Right. Well, Pastor Rock, I just want to say thank you. Um, it, this has been a great conversation. I know it's going to be a blessing to those who, who watch this on that. But thank you, too, for... Um, I mean, I, I came into a culture here at ACAC that was used to being led by a pastor who was spirit-led. And um, it puts a lot of pressure, uh, but it's good pressure. And I just, I just... But um, that's what you want to be. Yeah, Because what's the alternative? Absolutely, absolutely. Not only for the church, but yeah. for you, what's the alternative? Yeah, and, yeah. There, and we're blessed with so many staff, elders, you mentioned, you know, mm-hmm. tra- finance committee, all of that, who genuinely want to discern what are the errands that, that God has. So thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it.